Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I am here with John Couch, who was the 54th employee at Apple and later became vice president of software. He retired in his 30s and went on to revitalize a faith-based uh, school in California and worked at several other projects. Later, Steve Jobs brought him back as the first VP of education at Apple. He's, got, uh, he's been working on a new book and it's out. It's called Rewiring Education, How Technology Can Unlock Every Student's Potential. So I'm really interested in your book and it's so nice to have you here, John. That's my pleasure. Well, my first question for you is, can you describe the motion of a spinning top in free space? <laughs> uh, you I'm know, sure people uh, ask you that all the time. Huh? I, I, I didn't memorize it, and I panicked in my uh, final exam. Uh, and it's unfortunate, because what I really should have done was just relaxed and thought about it and thought about you know, the force in which direction I would spin it and, you know, try to derive at least partial equations. But, you know, that's, well, we're talking about 1968, and uh, the mode of, um, of success for me in those days was just to memorize everything and then, and then regurgitate it. Well, I think we should probably, in all fairness to people listening, explain what I, why I even asked you that. Um, uh, you want to give the backstory on it? Well, you know, it's funny because... Um, I was looking through my high school yearbooks uh, a, a few years back, and I found in my senior yearbook, 1965, a salutation from a good friend, William Selectman, who went on to West Point, and it basically wrote, he basically wrote, Couch and Aristotle are now synonymous. Keep memorizing those problems. Oh. And it, and uh -huh. it hit me. Uh -huh. that's, that's exactly what we did, whether it was physics or chemistry or or algebra we just memorized the formulas and then you know repeated them back on the test and you know we were rewarded with national honor society and in scholarships and uh, that worked really well up until my junior year in college as a physics major when i walked into the final exam and there was one question and that question was describe the motion of a spinning top in free space oh. And I watched, you know, a whole class of really smart people panic because it had never been covered in the lecture and it wasn't present in the book. Yeah. Um, and it just so happened that same semester, a friend of mine encouraged me to take a class with him called Horticultural Science 120. And I said, well, what is what is that? He goes, well, ignore the name. It's the only department that can afford a computer it's computer programming. And in the process of taking that class, I realized that when you are writing code, when you're trying to solve a problem, there's nothing to memorize. Yeah, right. You actually have to visualize your, your data structures, the relationship between those data structures, give them some inputs, and get to a desired output. And I got excited about that. And so at the end of my junior year, I looked around the United States to find a, a university that offered an undergraduate degree in computer science, not a not a major in electrical engineering or math, with you know some classes in computer science, but a but a, a true degree in computer science. And I found that at UC Berkeley, transferred to Berkeley, finished the undergraduate in four quarters, and then did my master's and another four quarters of doctorate work. So it changed my life. Wow. Now, what year did you graduate your undergrad? 69. Yeah. There wasn't a lot 70, of choices back no. then. No. Wow. <laughs> I'm, in fact, I have one of the first 54 computer science degrees awarded. Wow. I mean, they were just adding computer uh, courses at, at the university oh. when I was going. And, and, and I can remember, I mean, one of my first jobs was selling computer 36s and 38s. I mean, it's been a while. <laughs> since <laughs> I, I, so, you're, you know, I have, the, I, I understand what you're saying back then. There, there wasn't the opportunities to learn this stuff. So, 
is no. that so you got on the radar with these really big named uh companies but you you um tell a story that uh steve uh jobs won you over for maybe and didn't actually pay you as much as you were making somewhere else isn't that kind of how yeah. it started well there's there's actually a little bit of a backstory to that because while i was at berkeley mm -hmm. from 68 through 72 which were you know pretty tumulus years yeah. <laughs> with the uh -huh. societal revolution right i had access to lawrence radiation livermore labs where i sat in front and had sole control of a seven and a half million dollar computer to do my homework nice and i realized that the true revolution was not taking place in the streets and at people's park but it was taking place right where i was sitting in front of all that power and um when i met steve um how well, steve was uh, had started uh, apple in 1977 and at 77 i met him in 78 and uh, he shared with me his vision if you will for apple computer and he told me a story uh, he had read an article in Scientific American where they had run a test on the efficiency of motion of man and, uh, and, and, and animals. And man was a disappointing, uh, you know, sort of halfway down the list. But someone had the foresight of rerunning the test, this time with man riding a bicycle. And in Steve's thinking that um, we have the God-given talents to build tools to amplify not only our physical ability, but also our intellectual ability. So he saw technology really as a mental bicycle. And, you know, that vision excited me because um, I had seen that, you know, in front of that $7.5 million computer, and what Steve was showing me was a $2,500 computer. A personal computer. Wow! Yeah. And so I I could see the future, and I shared and I shared Steve's vision. The challenge for me, of course, was um, Steve had put a maximum forty thousand dollar a year salary on all employees, including himself and the president of the company, because he wanted people to join the company who shared his vision, and not who saw it as an economic opportunity. So. I went from taking over a laboratory of about 140 people to manage no one, to work for a 21-year-old kid, and to take a <laughs> substantial pay cut. Wow. Wow. Well, what did you see in him? Or what I, Well, you? obviously, you know, Steve, Steve was um, very charismatic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think most and mostly I shared his vision. Mm -hmm. of what technology could do for the individual. Um, and um, secondly, I saw the opportunity to be part of something new, uh, to really uh, create the future. In fact, Steve challenged me with building a computer that um, anyone could use. And uh, I knew that the answer to that was not going to be in the hardware, it was going to be in the software and that's what i had had been trained to do so you were more the software guy and he was more the hardware guy I, right i was a software mm -hmm. guy right mm -hmm. in fact i mean apple didn't really think much about software in the early days they had two programmers they came to school at three o'clock in the afternoon because that's when high school got out right and uh i was originally hired as director of new products working for steve to help define the future Apple products, but six months later, I was made the first vice president of software for the company with the challenge to really build out the graphical user interface. Well, so what? How much did you work with? Uh, you know, the other night we met at, with Steve Wozniak was speaking and a few others at a Des Tech AZ event, and so I noticed that Steve Wozniak uh, wrote the foreword, I think, in your book. And uh, I, how much did you work with Steve Wozniak? Well, originally, uh, not too much, because mm -hmm. Steve was focused primarily on the Apple II, mm -hmm. and I was focused on more of the new products. But, um, you know, 
Steve has a passion for education as well as jobs and myself. Mm -hmm. So when I re when I after I retired and returned to the Silicon Valley, I actually shared an office with Steve Wozniak. Well, that had uh, to be entertaining because he was, you know, teaching uh -huh. fifth grade and um, and his his wife worked for me for 15 years. So, um, you know, he was an, he was a natural to write the forward because of his passion and then for education and and for his, you know, watching me over the years uh, be involved in, in, in education at Santa Fe Christian and uh, and then returning to returning to the Bay Area. And and that's when Steve uh, Jobs coming back to Apple asked me to join him and to, you know, fix education because they had had declining sales for many, many years. Well, so you and Steve Jobs both went to Apple, left Apple, went back to Apple. Uh, what was the difference for both of you? Uh, did you see a difference with him the second time when he came back? And was there a difference with you that when you came back? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there was a total difference between Steve. I think he had, you know, when we first worked together, he was, you know, young 20s mm -hmm. and uh, still sort of learning how to how to deal with people and uh, the industry in general, although he was, you know, brilliant mm -hmm. uh, and quite the entrepreneur. But, you know, coming back, he had gone through some failures uh and he was much more mature and uh obviously understood the culture at apple the the innovation uh culture and um i think he was probably the only one that could have saved apple uh i had actually had two interviews at apple prior to steve coming back uh with two different ceos and in both cases i chose not to come back to apple because I didn't think they really had a grasp on, on the culture. Mm -hmm. And of course, Steve did, because Steve initially created the culture around his vision that technology would empower us to create, to innovate, and to go places we hadn't been before. Well, you know, it's fun. My uh, son-in-law works at Apple. I don't know if I told you that the other night, but it, it, I've, I've gone to the uh, campus. If, uh, it's like a campus. I don't know if you call it that uh, a few times. And it, it's I re the thing that stood out to me is some of the rooms have uh, like no windows. So you they, everything's very private. You, can, you wouldn't be able to get a, you can't get a drone in there to spy on you or anything, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was a big difference. That was a big change, too, uh -huh. because in the early days, I used to get, I used to give Steve a hard time because I used to say, you know, Steve, it's a strange shit that leaks from the top because Steve would Steve would be so excited about the new products that he would go. And tell people about that. <laughs> and but when I came back, everything was just buckled down in security. And I mean, I even had to sign non-disclosure agreements uh, when I was shown future products. Yeah, yeah. My my son-in-law won't tell me anything. But I uh, I know that uh, you now are you still like on contract with them, or have you left Apple? I wasn't sure exactly where that stood. Well, because of the book, the company decided that. They really didn't want to set a precedent of a vice president writing a book. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to move from a from a W-2 to a 1099. Okay. So I retired on May 8th when the book was released. Uh, but they've kept me on as a consultant for three quarters uh, as I uh, finish up some of the speaking engagements that, that Apple committed me to. Yeah. Well, you, your book has, is really interesting. I, um, I, I was listening to the audio version of it over the weekend. It's titled uh, Rewiring Education, How Technology Can Unlock Every Student's Potential. And that's, of course, right up my alley. I mean, I've taught more than a thousand online business courses. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote my um, dissertation on emotional intelligence. And some of the things you're talking about are also in, uh, in my book I'm writing about uh, curiosity and we talked about that the other night and which interests me because you write a lot about things that fall into the creativity curiosity realm and some of the things um, I found that stop yeah. uh, that inhibited curiosity of course uh, failure was one of them but some of it I found four things it was um, 
uh, fear of uh, failure, different things. So fear, uh, assumptions, technology, and environment. And you could touch on a lot of environmental and assumption and fear and a lot of the things that I found as I was going through your book. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great as I'm going yeah. through, you know, because yeah. you don't even really you talk much more about the background. You get into technology later on in the book, but you're really going into what is wrong with education and how we're impacted. And uh, you talk about the natural creativity that we have as a yeah. child. How does that change yeah. from being a very young kid and then middle school and so on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think I I get to, to technology until chapter 13 because I really talk about learning. Right. And what are the components of learning? And mm -hmm. one of my favorite quotes is Joe Ito from the Media Lab at MIT where he says, education is what people do to you. <laughs> learning is what you do for yourself. Oh, yeah, it's great. And, um, and uh, you know, I used to I used to teach Apple University in the early days, and I would have banners. And one of my banners was "Curiosity is worth 100 IQ points." Uh -huh. And it's 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 really sad that you know we can go all the way back to 1846. Frederick Freebold's uh, invented kindergarten, which stands is German, stands for children in the garden, and his philosophy was that the children were were creative beings that they were they were created by a god who was a creative god and that kindergarten should be all about creativity and so he he they danced and they had music and they moved and they went into the gardens and into nature and then he built a set of tools called the free the Froebel gifts and these were these were blocks but there's like nine different gift sets and in fact they're still used at MIT in the, in the Graduate School of Architecture. Uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright was really involved with these, with these Froebel gifts. And um, it's ironic that when they came over to the United States, Milton Bradley was the manufacturer of the Froebel gifts, and they put the alphabet on them, hmm. which was just, you know, uh, just the opposite of what Freebel was all about. And so when you take a look at our kindergarten classes today, they're all about worksheets and they're all about literacy. And uh, that was not the original intention of, of, of Freeball. And, you know, and I thought about it for a minute and I thought, well, wow, you know, here we are 130 years later and here comes Steve Jobs in 1978 where he sees technology being the tools or the gifts for creativity. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, we've, you know, if you, if you look at um, Land's creativity test and you look at five-year-olds, I think it's 80% of five-year-olds, I've got it in my, in my talk, uh, are creative. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to be adults, only 2% yeah, are creative. Unbelievable. So we, we've lost it along the ways. And, and in a sense, I think we've just sort of layered concrete on, on, our, on the creative parts of our being and asked us to be just all the same. And if you've read Dr. Rose's book, The End of Average, you'll, you'll see that there is no such thing as average, that everyone is unique and everyone is an individual. Right. But our, our K-12 school system, which was defined by an essay in 1912 by the Board of Education, funded by John D. Rockefeller, was not to have creative beings uh, are not to bring creativity in the school, but teach the kids, you know, how to do the same thing at the same time for the industrial age. And here we are in 2018, and the majority of our schools are still buried, if you will, in that type of thinking and assessments. And what is it? What, what do we test? We test short term memory. We don't test potential. We don't test creativity. Um, we just test short-term memory. So, yeah, you, you hit on them. I think we don't allow failure, uh, which I think, you know, if you take a look at Thomas Edison, even take a look at Apple. Uh, you know, we try many things. Some don't work. Um, you know, I think one of, one, of, um, one of the lessons that I learned from uh, Bill Hewlett was more companies die from indigestion than starvation, and that means we try to do too much. 
And Steve turned that around and said, we take as much pride in the eight things we don't do as the two things that we do do. Hmm. And obviously we've had some failures in getting to those two things that we do do. So, you know, the purpose of the book was just to start a conversation uh, to get parents to think a little bit differently. Uh, my favorite audience, if you will, is is the boards, education boards, because they're sort of my age, they're grandparents, and they know their grandkids are a lot smarter than the schools are allowing them to be. Yeah. And so that's a fun that's a fun group to to challenge. And I and I don't believe education is going to change top down. I really believe it's going to change bottom up as more people start to realize and 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 explore some of the technology that's out there, uh, adaptive learning, um, uh, augmented reality, some of the new uh, learning platforms that are that are coming on um, on scene. And uh, that's why the last chapter is Gandhi's quote is be the change. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great quote. And you talk about a lot of things in your book um, in terms of change and how technology has changed uh, just so many things. And I'm curious, how has it changed the way people are learning or their ability to be curious? I mean, are we letting technology do too too much for us that we don't desire the need, you know, to, to learn more? Or No, it's actually, it's actually just the opposite mm-hmm. because the majority of technology in schools is being used strictly as a substitution. So instead of reading a book, you know, mm-hmm. we're reading we're reading content off the internet. So, are, are what, we asking what, questions about that as much as we could? Yeah, well, you know, I don't think so because see, there's a huge uh, training effort that needs to take place mm-hmm. for our teachers. Um, our teachers need to realize that you know that being a content expert, you're not alone anymore because all content is free and it's all yeah. freely available. But the real challenge is to put that content in a, in a context, in, in, a, in a relevant context, something that's relevant to the students, um, where the students can be the creators of, of new content and not just the cons- consumers of old content, where the students can work together in a collaborative manner because Vygorsky's research says that's how we learn. You know, when I went to school, collaboration was called cheating. <laughs> and then and then finally, in uh, a con- in a context that's challenging, right? Like like games, like the games are. Uh-huh. And so we created a framework at Apple, working with universities and and other educational experts called challenge based learning, where the students actually solve real relevant community problems. Yeah, I mean, that's so important. I mean, at a time, uh, there was a time where we thought, well, it, well, technology meant, you know, we can add uh, videos to the class and Schoolhouse <laughs> Rock was big. And, and you know, and I think you even said private charter and online schools, you know, can be just as as bad as the regular schools if they don't do something different, right? Different, I mean, yeah, something I better, think, right? It's yeah, I had, a, I had about an hour and a half meeting with Secretary Betsy uh, Rock. DeVos and mm-hmm. and you know she's a very much a proponent for charter schools right and we'll try, you know and like, charter schools can be great but are you changing the pedagogy mm-hmm. you know are you changing the what we do in the classroom or are you still basing it on memorization and um, it's kind of interesting because if you go back in history with Thomas Edison and John Dewey and the battle there Edison thought his videos would change education right right but they're just they're just as passive as anything, right? Because mm-hmm. you just sit and and listen and watch, and and the, you know, you know if you go all the way back to free ball, Freud ball, we need to be active, you know. That's the way our brains are. Our brains are formed, you know, are designed to work in motion, in different you know different uh, uh, weather conditions, and you know and. Um, Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think of the the author of the book um, uh, on, the, on the brain theory book, but um, Todd Rose. No, Todd. Todd oh, that. does individual. Mm-hmm. Uh, John John Medina. Oh right. John Medina. Mm-hmm. John Medina says if you were design a learning environment that was directly opposed to the way our brains work, it would be a classroom. 
you know. <laughs> well, there, there are, it's unfortunate that there are a lot of uh, situations that still need to be um, changed. And I know that you, you and I mentioned Todd Rose a second ago, and you had mentioned him before. He, you talk about him and his being one of the smartest people out there in the Boston area. And, uh, he uh, was. He, can you tell the Todd story that you gave in the book? Because I thought it was yeah, kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, Todd, you know, Todd's written three books. His <laughs> first book, I think, was something like a, a square, you know, a round peg in a square hole or something like uh -huh, that. Right. A square and a round, which was his story about him dropping out of high school with a D minus average, uh, getting his girlfriend pregnant, having two kids and working, you know, basically, you know, limit, minimum wage um, when he decided to go back to school. And of course the school says, well, you need to take this remedial course and this remedial course. And Todd goes, well, I really want to take this graduate course. Because uh -huh. I'll flunk if I take those remedial courses because I have no interest, uh -huh. which gets into the chapter in our book on intrinsic motivation. Right, right. right. And um, and so he found a mentor and he, you know, took that course. And today he runs the individuality lab at Harvard University. And uh, he wrote uh, End of Average, uh, which is a great book that shows there's no such thing as average and how did the word average really even come into our vocabulary and has great stories about, you know, the, the, to the challenge the U.S. U S air force had when they went from regular planes to jet propulsion planes and all the crashes. And it, and it turns out the reason was because they had a, they had designed a fixed cockpit seat for men uh, of the average size. And when they went out and interviewed, 2000 pilots they found that there was no one pilot that that fit the average size <laughs> and so the uh -huh. air force had to redesign the seats so that they were dynamic and can be changed like our car seats today yeah and of course the, the crashes uh stopped he's got a new book out called dark horses uh which is an interesting book and um, he actually references my story in there as a graduate student at uc berkeley having passed all the prelims, but the department wanting me to do something like proven programs correct. And I wanted to work more on the interface of the world uh, uh, of computers to, to humans. So I dropped out and six years later, I ran into Steve Jobs who challenged me with the exact you know, interface challenge that I was interested in back in grad school. See, that all you know, falls into that, you know, what I'm talking about in terms of environment. Uh, there are people, some people will push us in certain directions. And you know, I, I think that that has such a big impact on our curiosity and, and other, you know, uh, abilities. Yeah. And But there's other things that impact it. And I think it's interesting that you have some kind of a, a background in epigenetics, don't you? Didn't you work... Uh, at, weren't you at uh, Double Twist? Or was that a... Yeah, uh -huh. well, that was... A that was a fish out of water. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, that job? Well, when I came back after I after I left the school after ten years of rebuilding the school uh -huh. and being in, being involved on a day by day basis working with students and and faculty, I came back and uh, was asked to be an entrepreneur in residence called Pay at Mayfield, mm -hmm. uh, one of the VC funds on Sand Hill Road, mm -hmm. and they they dropped me into a number of different internet companies. It was early on in the game. And, but they dropped me into one company called Pangea, and um, they were doing custom uh, software for bioinformatics. And I didn't know. I, I not, not only did I know did not know what bioinformatics, I didn't know how to spell it. So that was <laughs> so that was a real challenge. But uh -huh. I, what we did was we used technology to process the data in the human genome with the goal of finding the protein that would be unique, uniquely tailored to your DNA. Hmm. And, and I found that, you know, when I was, after I left there and I changed the name of the company to double twist and we recreated a, a software environment with multiple software agents that would tell a, a researcher all about their sequences, you know, whether it was patented, where it was found in literature, mm -hmm. what it was homologous to. But when I, when I, when Steve asked me to run education, I thought, oh, my gosh, we got the same challenge in education. 
we need to find the gap in a student's knowledge and deliver to that student the appropriate learning activity to help him overcome that gap. Right. Or we need to deliver a challenging learning activity to that student who's bored in school. Well, and, and we're uh, treating everybody the same. Do we get to like a lowest common denominator to keep everybody involved in a way, don't we? Well, that's exactly what we do is we teach to the average. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the example that I used in the book, and I think the, the charts are actually on my website that corresponds to the book, mm -hmm. was a fifth, a fifth grade class in Chicago, Illinois. And when you looked at it, you had one student reading at the eighth grade level, one student reading at the first grade level and six different reading levels in that class. The time it would take a teacher to find the appropriate learning activity for those six different levels is over 40 hours a week. So in a sense, we're asking our teachers to perform, you know, a miracle every week. Right. You know, right. and you know, Steve Jobs used to ask me to do that. And I always <laughs> responded, you know, I, I believe in miracles. I just don't believe in scheduling them, you know? Um, <laughs> And that's what we ask our teachers to do. Uh huh. You know, you've got to, you're going to, you're going to reach the need of each of the 30 or 35 kids that you have in the classroom within the week. When one kid's reading at the first grade level and one kid's reading at the eighth grade level. But, you know, and then the, the irony of the irony of the data was when I looked at the math data, there was nobody above the fifth grade level because we don't huh. allow kids to go ahead in math. Right, right. Well, sometimes it, the teacher's not a, ahead of where <laughs> the student wants to go, and, and you get well. Some I of those think issues. you know. I think reading, uh, you know, I mean, the parents can have a a big impact on on a child's reading ability. Right. You know, as they start to read read to them when they're young, and encourage and you know with an intrinsic motivation to read. Right. Uh, Whereas I think it's a little bit more of a challenge for parents to do that in mathematics. It, it can be. And, but yeah. you, you, when we talked about the genetics part of it, do you think you can be born with the, the good genes to be smarter or are we all born with the same abilities and then some of it's just knocked out of us through environment? No, and, you know, we, we discussed this in the book, uh -huh. you know, and um, we, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, the you impact said. of environment, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not either or, it's both. Right, right. You know, you can be born with a little bit more genetic makeup, <laughs> uh, but your environment's going to have a big impact. And the other thing, of course, is our DNA is not static. It's dynamically changing. So uh, it's kind of an ongoing, ongoing process. So it's both it's both genetics being born, but it's also genetics in your environment. I thought it was interesting. what you're exposed to. You, you mentioned David Schenk, the author of The Genius in All of Us. Is that the book he wrote about how people can impact their, their genomes with their own behavior? I, I found that interesting. I, uh, yeah, that's a whole neat area. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the sad thing is not just that. In writing the book, I just realized that so much academic research in terms of how the brain works how important in, intrinsic motivation is, um, it, you know, has never really integrated itself into our K-12 classrooms. Why do you think that is? You know, it's a, it's a really good question. I think, I think first and foremost, our teachers are, you know, they're so overwhelmed right. by just the, the, the individuality of 30 or 40 kids in the classroom. Right. Um, and so there's, there's very little time and we provide very little professional development for them. Uh, you know, I really think that we need to redefine the role of the teacher from a member of the union to, to a professional organization where there is ongoing training, like my accountant, you know, my accountant is in, is in, is in, is in learning environments and professional development half the time. Yeah. Right. I mean, even real estate agents. I mean, some of the people out there are yeah. constantly. Lawyers. Right. Yeah, everyone. Uh-huh. Yeah. But teachers. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder, That's it's interesting how it is. And, and the motivation aspect of what, um, you chapter four was all about motivation. And I, I, I could relate to your story of um, your daughter, Tiffany. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, 
that, that who she discovered her passion and went in a, in a different direction. And I have a daughter who I, you know, thought might be interested in getting an international business degree because she could speak four languages, but it really wasn't her passion. And, you know, parents, sometimes yeah. we suggest things, you know, because you want your yeah. child, you know, to help them. But then some parents will push them too far and say, you know, this is what you have to do. How, you know, how do we know if we're helping our child find the right thing or if we're pushing them too much, you know? Do well, you know, you know, I, you know, I have 16 grandkids mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I, I can tell well, let's just say 10 of them are probably under the age of 10, uh -huh. maybe 11 and, and the other five are in college right now. And, you know, I mean, the ones that are in college aren't necessarily <laughs> studying where, what they're really good at. Right? Uh -huh. I have a, I have a granddaughter that's brilliant, you know, straight A's. Uh, she was in pre-med and now she's decided to transfer to Savannah School of Art and Design for fashion like her mom. Mm -hmm. Okay. But she's got an incredible voice, hmm. you know, and, and very gifted in music. And I'm just I'm just waiting for her to sort of discover that mm -hmm. and, and and the value of that. But she comes from uh, a family, particularly on on the father's side that you know probably push the medical mm -hmm. um and you know you're smart you you know you get straight a's you can get into the schools but in fact i was working with a fellow at john hopkins university on their admissions because they're finding that a lot of the students that they admit really don't want to be doctors hmm. you know that they've been pushed into that that's interesting and so they're they're trying to discover that in the admissions process rather than at the end right because all those spots for the people who really want it yeah. you know, aren't getting it exactly and, and that, the need yeah. of course is right there. right well i i do then, meet a lot of doctors who step down and it surprises yeah. me to go through all that and then to not follow me through. too that's a lot me of too. money and time i mean my husband's a doctor and i was a pharmaceutical rep for a long time and i i, I do meet a lot and then the, yeah. the ones who are in and see that happen, get frustrated with them too, because they, you know, had to go through so much to get in. And but there's so much pressure. You talk about the pressure, though, that we put. Yeah, on I wonder our if kids. they just don't burn out. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, I I kind of burn out after the first five years at Apple. You know, yeah. it was the fastest growing company in American history at the time. Yeah. You know? and, well, you had and a I, grit factor, I, stopped, I guess, huh? I stopped. I stopped coding, and you know, and. Um, and just wanted to help people. And that's why I ended up spending 10 years in that K-12 school environment in terms of turning that school around. Well, what made but, you want to come back then? Uh, uh, well, I, I came back not as a programmer, but I came back to, to run education mm -hmm. for Apple. So I was able to, you know, and Steve told me this when I left Apple, you know, he uh -huh. goes, John, he goes, I want, he says, this is great because you're going to take some of the lessons that you've learned in business into the education community, and then you can bring back from the education community lessons that we can learn about education. So he, Steve already saw that. Mm -hmm. Steve saw that right from the very beginning. Um, you know, that's just who Steve was. Right. Um, he think... was always looking, always looking down the road. Do you think he would have been the one to, to reinvent education had he lived? I mean, w everybody keeps wanting to Uberize everything, you know what I mean? To flip it the, uh, and reinvent the industries. But everybody I talk to all thinks education's the one that's ripe for it, but nothing really changes. What, what, yeah, it's what's like, it going to take? Well, it's like trying to move a 20,000 pound marshmallow, you know, <laughs> as, as much as you push into it, it kind of, doesn't go anywhere. So I, I think what we have to do over time is just we have enough people who, you know, answer the be the change and start taking bites out of it. Um, but yeah, I do think uh, that if Steve were still alive today, I would probably still be at Apple and he would be investing in what I believe we need to do, which is individualized learning and the role of technology is going to play a very a big part in that. Uh, in the same way, iTunes Music can make recommendations on music based on your preferences, past preferences. 
I think the same technology can be used to make recommendations on learning activities based on the analytics that are available. Well, I, I think that there's so much that can be done. And you, I think you tell a story of Elon Musk's kids, right? Did, uh, yeah. I, I thought that was an interesting story. I mean, not, yeah, I think that w what people are looking for, we're not getting. And what, can, you, can you share that story? Well, I think he started a school for his boys because he, you know, they need to be solving problems, uh -huh. you know, not memorizing. And you know? so, so he has ah. the same outlook that you have. Yeah. That yeah. You, well, you know, because that's what I think. I was horrible in history as a child because I don't really have a, the, the great ability to memorize. And yeah. then that history, well, to me, was memorizing dates, a lot of it. And math, I love because you had to get an answer. You couldn't <laughs> memorize it. And yeah. so I understand when I saw your book, I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I think. I mean, I, I, you, I really was not able to, to, I mean, you could memorize it, but then it, it would be gone like the next day after I took the yeah, test. Yeah, 20 minute, 20 minute <laughs> short term memory. Right. Well, that's, that's why I used, I gave the example. See, a lot of people go, well, what's challenge based learning? Because they've never been exposed to it, mm -hmm. right? Right. You know, uh, Emerson's quote. People can only perceive what they've seen. So I use the example of California history uh, in the book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, normally what's happened in California is every fourth grader needs to take California history. And the publishers put just a minimal amount of material into the textbook such that they can get approved by the state. And so the teachers fundamentally teach about missions. You know, and you'll get your dates and you'll get your missions. Um, and they, you know, they don't talk about presidios. They don't talk about the relationship between, you know, Mexico and California and, and you know, where history really comes alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they give you they give you a project and it's a single person project again. And you're to build a mission out of sugar cubes, you know. And I say, well, if it comes in in anything other than sugar cubes, you know, the parents were involved <laughs> unless it was unless it yeah. was Minecraft. And then if uh. it was Minecraft, you know, the students did it. And so the I, I then said, well, let me give you an example of a challenge based learning environment. And you would basically tell the students, you are William Randolph Hearst. And they would go, well, who's William Randolph Hearst? Mm -hmm. You know, expecting you to deliver that to them. Right. No, you have to go. You have to go discover. Right. Because in learn, challenge based learning is about discovery, not about delivery. And so you would learn that. He was the uh, owner of the San Francisco Examiner uh, and that he built Hearst Castle, which was a collection from all over the world. So now as a team, you're working as a team, you're going outside of California. You're looking at different animals that are coming in. You're looking at different artwork that's coming in. You're looking at architecture. And he would throw a party every Friday night for his friends from Hollywood. And he had a very long dining room table. So your challenge is you're going to throw a dinner party for those in California individuals who made the biggest impact. Who would you invite and what would the seating chart look like? That's great. And, you know, that's an exploration. Uh -huh. that, that's working as a team. You're going to find that first governor in California was Fremont, and his goal was to annihilate the Indians. So you're going to have a debate on whether he should even be invited, you know, and then you're going to say, well, where does Steve Jobs fit in? You know, where does um, Cesar Chavez fit in? And, you know, you're just it's just an incredible learning environment because you're motivated to discover. Well, you know, the, the thing I found, though, you know, is the team activities are such a great idea. But then when we would have them in class and when I mean, when I went to school, I was on a lot of teams for to get my bachelor's and master's and whatever in, in business and then i of course as i taught business courses we've had teams and you what you find is so many people you'll get a few people like you who are really motivated and want to do the work and then you get a few that just who who have probably their degrees right now because of people like you who are on their team that did all the work right well yeah i you know how do you get I away from that? that but i i think technology changes that a little bit too so if you look at the example that I use in the book about um, Jody Domheimer, mm -hmm. who teaches 11th grade anatomy, and, and the kids, see the challenge-based learning, challenge-based learning, the teacher doesn't create the challenge. 
the kids create it mm -hmm. out of out of what they're interested in. Right. So automatically it's relevant, right? Right, right. And they now become the creators. And so the kids wanted to take the material that Jody was teaching at 11th grade, repurpose it into a book and a courses for the younger kids. And so they broke up in teams. And what was interesting to me was the young girl who was given the assignment to do the illustrations for the book and the courseware was not considered a, a great student. But today she's a medical illustrator because it was that project that opened up her ideas and her interest and passion in illustration. Yeah. And I was thinking about that and I was going, what course did I take in high school that it would even have given me a hint that there was a job in medical illustration, you know, right. uh, and or whether I was even interested in medical Well, there's just so many areas. I mean, we can't be exposed to everything is the thing. And it's so no, hard. But, but projects opened you up to more. Right, right. Well, yeah. you know, I've taught some team activities where we ta taught it on a wiki, which was kind of nice because you could, <laughs> you could see the backside of who was putting in what and when and how much time, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And exactly. I, I mean, I'm not as techie as you are by any means, but, you know, it did help me to see that. And I think that, uh, but I like the idea of what you're saying is giving them the idea of what they want to write about. And I think that there's so many ways to improve. Um, I think what I was interested in doing with my research was just to get people to look at their natural levels of curiosity because they've been so impacted by either yeah. we're given these, these, uh, ideas that we don't even find interesting or we the things we do find interesting the teachers don't have time like well, you, in your example you know they yeah. they have well, 40 I mean, hours a week it would our, take our, our our path is well defined for us mm -hmm. you know the ladder the rungs on the ladder are very well defined you know you go to you go to school you go to high school you get into college you get your degree you become a professor or you know you go into the industry Mm -hmm. And and you'll you'll enjoy Dr. Rose's new book called Dark Horses because he really he really challenges that. Right. And he challenges it from a standpoint of fulfillment of purpose. You know, are you are you are you do you have a fulfilled life, a purpose uh, filled life? Um, and he uses a lot of great examples. One of them he uses is the young lady who with no education, just had a passion for the stars became the first person to discover a planet since the 1800s. Wow. Because of her passion. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, there's so much that we could do to help people become more curious and driven and motivated. I, I just, I, I think that your book's really important to open up the dialogue. Like you said, you wanted to t make this a discussion, but wh where do you think we got, you, you said it, it's up to the parents, really, that you think will change this. But mm -hmm. uh, are, are because they going I, to? Yeah, because I think um, you know, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience with with schools and even states. The state of Maine, when Governor King gave a, every seventh grader in the state an, an iBook, mm -hmm. and watching parents being against it because that's not the way they learned, right? right? Uh -huh. And then finding out a year later that in seeing their kids be creative and explorers and, and passionate about learning. And then a year later, the possibility of, of the iBooks, you know, them going to eighth grade and not having iBooks and a total change of attitude on the parents' part. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think there's going to be alternatives out there. I'm working right now with a, with a company called Notion, which has spent $12 million and developed a incredible challenge-based learning curriculum from age three through 15 in Mexico and South America. I think they have 40 or 50,000 students on it right now. And they're, they're going to donate that to me for a, a nonprofit called beyondschool.com. And I want to make that available for preschool, you know, in Haiti, in Africa, uh, homeschooling, and I, I think there's going to be other, you know, other uh, efforts like this uh -huh. that that 
parents are going to discover. And, um, and I think even schools are going to discover because if I start at if I start at preschool, um, you know, I don't run into all of the, you know, the weight of the 20,000 pound marshmallow that exists, <laughs> that exists in the day by day, you know, classroom. Well, does it address uh, emotional intelligence, soft skills and that type of yes, stuff? It does. See, it does. That's yeah. what I'd like to see more yeah. of in the K through 12. And I, yeah, I, you know, um, it's it, we're a little early on that. Um, I worked with Trip Hawkins who worked for me at Apple in the early days and then went off to do electronic arts. Mm -hmm. And we created a, uh, a, an emotional intelligence game um, and working with Disney and, and others. It's got some, the schools weren't ready to, you know, to accept it. That's so we've got, some, we've got some work there too. You know, it, it's interesting because I think the revolution has begun. It's just not equally distributed. So that my next book called Education Rewired are going to be stories, uh, you know, great stories of schools that are doing very, very unique things uh, on behalf of their students. Yeah. And again, so parents can say, wow, you know, where's my 3D printer? Where's my, you know, learning laboratory? You know, why aren't, why aren't my middle school students building solar, solar cars? Uh, you know, I think we're starting to see some of that. Uh, with robotics and things of that nature. But, you know, it's kind of ironic because people people aren't connecting the past dots with the future dots. I was just in, in Kenya, and I was on a panel with, minist with ministers and the, the cellular company. And the ministers were saying, well, our goals are education and our goals are manufacturing. But when they were thinking about manufacturing, they were thinking about the 1912 manufacturing, not the robotic manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And that they were not connecting the needs for robotic manufacturing back to the educational system. Right, right. So, you know, there's this cyclic <laughs> kind of environment, you know, uh, ecosystem that people seem to only have one of the three parts. Right. And, and yet it takes three parts to make it work. Well, with all that is happening now with innovation, with AI and, um, you know, so many people going to be, you know, removed yeah. from their jobs, displaced or whatever. Do you see that we're going to have uh, a need for Question. higher education, re-education? Where, where, where do you think that stands? Yeah, I do. And I think it's one of the reasons that we started Was You. Yeah. Uh, was just to start to ad address some of those questions, you know. Yeah. You'd be able to get re 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 read, you know, rebuilt, if you will, in mm -hmm. 14, 14 weeks for cybersecurity, for you know, for jobs that are there or that are going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know, it's interesting. Um, a friend of mine, Caleb at the MIT lab, has has built an operating system for growing vegetables. He's hmm. got a great TED talk called um, "Even Broccoli Has a URL," <laughs> and um, they're basically democratizing uh, farming huh. by by building this uh, these uh, by growing plants inside these chambers that can be as large as you want them to be, so that we could grow food inside in the desert. Wow. Uh, because you know, food growing isn't democratized. Uh, certain regions can do it, other regions can't. And so when you looked at his team, you know, he's got botanists and biologists and computer scientists and mechanical engineers. I mean, it is, it is a collection of talent. Right. And again, when I look at our schools, it's changing a little bit with, with health, you know, chemistry and biology and medicine and, and computer science coming together. But we're still fundamentally teaching silos. Right, right. And I, I read a paper the other day where they did a study of the last 100 Nobel Prize winners, and one of the one of the consistent um, characteristics of those winners was they cut across disciplines. Hmm. Well, and yet we're still teaching algebra separate from chemistry, separate from you know everything else. 
I, it's interesting to see what will happen with the future of education. And I, uh, I, I really was uh, fascinated by your book. I, I, uh, I, I was, um, I didn't get to read all of it. I read most of it because we just met a couple of days ago. I but, know. I'm, I know. I'm impressed. Yeah. It was, it, <laughs> no, it was so fascinating. And I was really fascinated, especially chapter four, because it's all dealing with the things that I'm dealing with, you know, with motivation yeah. and drive and curiosity and all that. But I, I went through and I read, I read most of it and I thought it was really good. And I think that there's so many people that need to, to, uh, be discussing this, not just t teachers, not just, you know, uh, yeah. administrators, uh, parents, everybody. And I think it's a really great book. And I think a lot of people should check it out. And I wish, could you just tell them how they could find it if they're interested? Well, Amazon mm -hmm. has it for like $16. Uh -huh. It's actually, it's actually cheaper to buy for me to, than for me to mail it. Um, and then I have rewiringeducation.com, which is a website it has a lot more backup material and and material from other uh, individuals like Sir Ken Robinson and even some uh, videos from great. Steve. Ted talk. And then yeah. I have a Facebook page, uh, Eden Inspirations, that right now has five thousand followers. So um, it's a it, you know I it like I said the goal was to start a conversation, and then we'll hopefully continue that conversation with the next one, which are going to be case studies, uh, things that people can identify with and bring to their own schools and, and question, well, how come we're not doing this? Right, right. And I think that this is a great start, and I really enjoyed having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for being on the show, John.